You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Formerly, you're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. And today is a long-awaited show with none other than Brian Johnson. Uh, I've been a, a, a remote fan of Brian's work, not in the field of longevity, which is something I think that he's been more public with the last couple of years, but because of his neuroscience background. So Brian started a company called Kernel that has what I would say is the most comprehensive way of looking at the human brain ever because he took his tech disruptor brain and said, why doesn't someone do this the right way? So first, Brian, hats off for your work with Kernel. And then let's talk about aging and brains and stuff like that. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, very few people are aware of Kernel or that neural tech is actually useful. We basically, in a similar way where the blood glucose monitors made it very easy to put one on the back of your arm Mm -hmm. and understand where your levels are at and then understand how food affects that, we're trying to do the same for the brain. Make it easy for anyone to figure out what happens to my brain when and to have biomarkers that help make decisions on health and wellness. It, it's, a, it's a shift from when we first talked about Kernel, where you were sort of saying, I want to know how the brain works so that uh, we can figure out how to make AI better. It seems like you shifted a little bit more into the, the brain wellness and brain as a, a, system, a sort of feedback on your environment, more of a biohacking approach. Yeah, the big dream is still that that which we can measure, we improve. And our brain is one of the remaining things about our existence that remains difficult to measure. So with more measurement, we can then create a closed loop feedback to improve ourselves with AI. So that's still the the ultimate objective. In the meantime, having it be practically relevant to daily life of making better health and wellness decisions, uh, you know, useful for pharma, for drug development, for other indications like cognitive decline and depression, mental health. Yeah, if we can be useful in those areas, then it's a win. It it is it is a win, and ultimately, who cares about having a body that lives a long time if your brain's not in there and doing good work? Um, it even on the AI side of things, it, it feels like uh, Jeff Hawkins, an old three com U.S. robotics guy, the guy who invented the handwriting analysis for the first handheld called the Palm Pilot way before your your phone. I used to work with that company uh, when Jeff was there. He's written a couple books that probably do explain how the brain really is architected and talks about AI. So I feel like we're making more progress theoretically and then you're doing some visual visualization stuff that almost no one knows about, but I think you deserve actually credit for that because you spent something like $80 million of your own money to figure out how the brain works. So kudos, my friend. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it, it, boy, was that difficult. Uh, it was my first time doing a deep tech startup mm-hmm. and we spent two years as a team looking at every possible modality that we could use to interface with the brain. We looked at, uh, we just started with the laws of physics. How could you potentially measure what was happening in the brain? We spent two years investigating every single approach. We acquired prototype systems. We stood them up internally, acquired data. And then we mapped each one to, is this commercializable? What do you need to do? Do you need to build custom chips? If so, who's the fab? Can you build them? Do they have the scale, the energy requirements? And then we spent Mm -hmm. uh, six years building it. We had a team of experts across uh, 12 different disciplines and we built it ground up. All the experts in the field didn't think this was possible and we pulled it (laughs) off. They they never do. I uh, I've been theorizing. We had a few conversations back and forth, and I've been you know fantasizing about doing some called HEG feedback or MEG feedback. And HEG, I actually used to sell a system like that years ago, but you put it all together in an elegant way. And and so if people are, are skeptical of your commitment to understanding biology, I, I, I kind of think that you already proved yourself with Kernel, even if maybe you didn't hire a good PR team to talk about it. Uh, but I, I, I just think it's a worthy effort in in furthering our understanding of being human beings and yeah, what's really going on in there. Even even now, I've tried to speak about kernel several times about measuring the brain and why it's potentially useful and interesting and exciting. No one cares. Uh, I just cannot yeah. get any pickup on that company. I mean, I did a a YouTube video with a bunch of uh, retirees, so mm-hmm. in their sixties, seventies, yeah. yeah, where they're trying to like. That moment of life where you know that the horizon is potentially threatening and you savor every moment. And uh, even that, it's been very, very hard to generate interest in a technology. It's just, it's not intuitive yet. People um, don't know why they would want to measure their brains. 
It's uh, it's I've never understood that as you know an early guy in the nootropics movement. Um, you know about my forty years of Zen because I want to get a kernel so I can use it to validate some of the work we're doing there. So I, I think yeah, I sent you an email yeah. about that like two years ago, and you're like, "We're not doing that." So I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, but I I uh, I do just as a genuine you know one biohacker to another want to uh, want to extend my respect for that. Thank you um, very much. Yeah, you're you're welcome. Now let's talk about uh, the biohacker thing. Professional rejuvenation athlete uh, versus a biohacker. What's the difference? When I first started doing this, I saw that people were struggling to put me into a category mm -hmm. that was intuitive to them. And so they would reach out in their mind and find a frame that they had. It was like, is this a, a biohacker? Is this a health enthusiast? Is this a right. blank and blank? And I didn't think that any of those things necessarily captured what we were trying to do. This was uh, an endeavor trying to map the next phase of human evolution. And like all good structures in human organization, competition breeds engagement. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, when you... Like I did this for two years, nobody paid attention, and then it went viral. And then people freaked out uh, not understanding why I was doing this, what I'm doing. But the, the disconnect was, if you observe an athlete like LeBron James and you see him taking care of his body and sleeping well and doing these things, no one's going crazy over LeBron James' protocol. They respect him for his play on the court. And so I thought the, the thing to do would be to reframe this endeavor as an mm -hmm. athlete because people respect uh, performance on the field. And what you do to achieve that is respected. Uh, whereas I was you, I was being vilified uh, because they didn't have an endpoint to connect it to. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the club, man. Yeah. Um, saying that you're going to reverse aging or you're going to live longer than you're supposed to, it really triggers a lot of muggles. And I, I eventually got to the point where I I think it's kind of a game, like. Oh, does it trigger you that I am planning to live longer than you are? Like, that's okay. Like, you'll be dead before I will. It, you know, like, there, there's just no rational argument for them. And I just realized they're not the people I'm trying to reach. Uh, the people who are triggered. But I have to ask you this, and this is a real thing. It took me a long time. Like, you know, I, Joe Rogan came after me for a while in a commercially related thing. I took a lot of hits in in making biohacking. I mean, way more than most people will ever will ever really comprehend. And eventually, I I got to the the point of amusement, but it was only after a lot of pain. And that kind of pain is not good for your longevity. It, it it's actually a negative, right? You're you're getting some criticism, I and mean, you're also getting a lot of like, what the heck is this guy doing? And it's usually vocal critics, a small percent. How do you keep all the critics from making you old? Mm. It's uh, the response is algorithmic. It's math. <laughs> it's it's mathematically predictable, you know. Okay. And so, if you, in any given time over the past couple thousand years, if you take norms of human behavior, and you plot a behavior that is outside two standard deviations from norm, you get a biochemical reaction and people responding to it. Mm -hmm. It's the same process that's been happening for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And so that's true for anything, is that basically responses are people identifying outside the norm thinking behavior you know, ideas. And so, yeah, it, it, uh, it's actually, I have zero emotional attachment to it. I view it with amusement, and I view it as predictable as the sun rising. Is that uh, you know we all experience our consciousness as unique and original, but it's not. <laughs> it's been playing on this loop for a long, long time, and so realizing that it really means nothing to me at all. It's just it's fun. Are you on the spectrum? <laughs> <laughs> Did that question provoke the question? That answer provoked the question. <laughs> I mean, it, it might have had a few little signals in it. <laughs> uh, I mean, the uh, that question has embedded within it uh, 
assumptions about what is normal and not normal, which then maps to what is good versus bad versus what is uh, respectable versus unrespectable or trustworthy, untrustworthy. So, with, um, mm, are you sure, or is that your own mapping? Because I, by the way, I had Asperger's syndrome for a long time, and I I fixed it, like I reversed it. Uh, and kept some of the aspects of it that were useful, but like I, I have no judgment about that. A lot of my friends are on the spectrum, so it, it, it's not about are you good or bad. It's just it's a question of yeah. like being neurotypical or average, which would be the same as normal, or possibly yeah. above average, which would be abnormal. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't suggesting that your statement was suggesting that. I'm saying in society, generally in a colloquial sense, when people say that, there's baggage associated with it. It's not. It doesn't come. With a neutral place of assessment, and so that's all I'm saying. Okay, because uh, some people uh, are judgy about that. Got it? Yeah, yeah. It's just like people uh, use that framework uh, sometimes in a way to be derogatory or as an insult mm. or to somehow ostracize someone from a community. And I, I frame it like this: I mean, I've read hundreds of biographies, mm-hmm. and when I read about people in their time and place, the patterns are so familiar that there's somebody <laughs> that identifies something that is unique and actually the future. And in response to that, they get the predictable outrage and, and crazy assessments and other things. And if my, my frame of thinking is I genuinely would rather be respected by people in the 25th century than I would to be respected right now. Because by definition, the majority of everyone who lives right now is living in the past, living the ideas of dead people. Now, we think we're future forward. We think we're on the cutting edge. The the majority of our values, ethics, norms, ideas, understandings really are of dead people. And that's been true for all of humanity. And you look back and you say, in those eras, the future was always present. And a Mm -hmm. very small sliver of society could identify it. But it was a very small sliver. And sometimes those people weren't vindicated for 100 years or 200 years. That's why we can look back at the 16th century with this cold, detached, objective view and say, it was so clear that you know, leeching was not a good idea as a way, you know, bloodletting was not the right thing for blankety blank. So that's why I say right now, I, I assume by default, which is a correct assumption, that the majority of that which is um, easily accessible to me in thought and action is uh, dated, and I need to search relentlessly for the future because it's hiding. It's very hard to see. Mm, so that sounds like a yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. This is one of the most fun pregnant pauses ever. I, so, wanted to go, I wanted it to go longer. <laughs> so you've looked at your brain. Um, I've observed your interactions with reality. And I, I actually can't tell, right? So now this is me being judgy, but not in a good or bad way, but just in like a neuro, neurological assessment sort of way, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And it's clear to me, and oh, if, if you don't like this part, I'm even happy to delete it, whatever. But it's clear to me because you've talked about it. Uh, that you have some some childhood trauma stuff that will affect the rationality. We all do. I've been open about mine as well. So no judginess there at all. And you also have like a very active, rational brain, right? And sometimes if you have the, the neurological wiring that comes from neuroinflammation when you're young that forces your brain to be hyper-efficient at some things, which is mm-hmm. kind of what puts you in the direction of ADHD or being on the spectrum, you'll present that way. And other times, you'll just do that because like, there is too much chaotic emotion in the brain that wastes electricity. And the brain's like, the easiest thing for me to do to be highly functional in the world is just to like, not worry about all that stuff and just rely on rationality mm-hmm. versus interoception. If, you, if, if you, do either one of those seem like a good assessment or are you just an alien or some other thing I haven't, yeah. I haven't thought of here? If yeah. you don't mind me asking, it's a pretty personal no, question. I'm trying to figure out no, what makes you tick. It's everything is open for discussion. So happy to go wherever you want. I find Robert Sapolsky's framework that he outlines in his new book, Determined, persuasive, where he articulates that in any given moment, we are influenced 
by millions of factors that date back thousands of years to two minutes and 10 minutes. And that we are, for the most part, oblivious to the forces that are upon us in any given moment that determine what we do, including childhood trauma, including my hormones, including my sleep levels last night. And so I kind of really enjoy this quote by Edward Murrow. It's kind of my favorite quote ever. Uh, those who are not confused don't really understand what's going on. <laughs> That's a great quote. I love that. So in this moment, you know, can I whip up a story of my self-assessment and do some Please. psychoanalysis? Yeah. And you know, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, could I? Uh, it would just be, in my estimation, pointless because of my complete obliviousness to what is really going on that invite my behaviors. And I wouldn't even begin to expect this. So I think it's actually a more honest answer to say, I have no idea. I would rather refer to a methodical framework like Sapolsky's and say, what are the factors? What weights do they carry? What is influencing my behavior? Than I would to try to uh, endeavor to answer the question with uh, being as naive as I am with all those variables. Mm. I, uh, I, I hear you. Uh, it sounds like uh, you're not going to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, your media training is really good. So uh, ni- nice, nice work. Thanks. <laughs> By the way, guys, um, you're listening to this, the media training. Uh, Brian and I have both been CEOs of sizable companies, and we've both had PR companies tell us exactly how to handle it. This wasn't a hostile question, but it was a difficult and funny question. So nice ninja moves, I just got to say. When I was doing uh, my first media training uh, it yeah. was at, at uh, Braintree when I had never engaged with press before. And there was one thing, they probably told me many things. I don't remember them. There was one thing I remember. They said, you don't need to answer the question. Yes. Yeah, like you're there to, to explain what you want to explain. You're not there to answer the questions. And so like the, the, the training was, your objective is to take their question and say yes and, and then figure out a way to answer the question in the way you want to talk about it. And you know, that was such a, uh, a significant mind shift for me because I had assumed in that situation that I was present to answer the reporter's question. Now, of yeah. course, when you hear this happening with politicians and <laughs> you know, they, they ask a question of like, you know, this, we want to know an answer to this thing. And the politician says something different. You're like, oh my God, just please answer the question because I don't want to hear your bullshit. So there's a really fine line that you need to be honest. You need to be transparent. You need to be to create the rapport with everyone so that what you're doing engenders trust and community. Also, not being trapped because the, the reporter clearly has agendas on making sharp edges and spinning a narrative they want. So it's a really delicate balancing act. You, you can never do so in a way that Di- creates distrust. That's that's a suicide right. mission. Right. Never create distrust. And in, in the modern world too, you can just receive a question and you can just mumble a bunch of words that don't make any sense and they still think yeah. you're you know suited, suitable to be a leader. Um, but this is not a comment about any political party versus another. I think that's true of all political yeah. parties. So there's that. Uh, so, all right. Who's your favorite Star Trek character? I've never watched Star Trek. Are you kidding me? You're a nerd. I, I don't believe you. Okay, Star Wars then? Uh, like, like, come on. Uh, what, what categorizes me as a nerd? Um, is that a real question? Yeah, I mean... So okay, you made this, but just here, you here's made, one you, little example. You spent $80 million studying the human brain and going into 12... I mean, you've, you've answered like 5,000 questions of the... 20 I asked you already, um, that say, nerd, 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 which is a compliment. I'm a nerd too. Like, like that is not at all derogatory unless you're still from the 80s, which we're not. So, yeah, so you know, I guess like, okay, why would neuroscience bundle with Star Trek? Um, well, geez, I mean, there, there's all sorts. I guess if you've never seen Star Trek, you wouldn't know. But there's whole times when they put on like virtual reality helmets. They have like the holodeck. Um, there's a whole thing with Wesley Crusher and um, these things that take over your brain with little lasers going into your eyes. I'm telling you, it's it's up your it's up your alley. <laughs> By the way, Brian and I have discussed science fiction over text or email a couple times, so I know he's into some sci-fi. I was just assuming that you would have at least you know 
made fun of one Star Trek character at some point. No, this this is of course this is why I choose to not answer questions about myself that uh, that get me into territory where I may be in trouble making assumptions with bundlings or certain psychoanalysis or other things. I mean, I I grew up where Star Trek was not a part of my life or my culture. Mm-hmm. Oh, of course. And I, of I, got course. To a, I got to a certain age in life and mm-hmm. it was, I was past it and I was never drawn into it. And so no, I, I miss... I have major cultural blind spots. Like I, fri- I find myself in conversation being clueless uh, more often than I do find myself in, in mm-hmm. the swing of things. And I'm, I'm oftentimes very surprised by my level of ignorance of cultural things. That makes so much sense. So let me ask you this then. How often are you lonely? I've never experienced the feeling of loneliness. Do you know how to recognize it if you did experience it? Uh, I understand it as an emotion that you you want to be with others. That like that basically like your being with self is inferior to being with others. And that it's a need, and I I don't know if I feel that emotion as as, as um, mm. something that drives me. I mean, I, I appreciate others, I appreciate community, and I appreciate mm-hmm. friendships and relationships, but it's not something that compels me to action in a way that uh, like I have a need. Like it's not like a a need present like hunger, where I feel like I'm driven to acquire food to satiate myself. Got it. Yeah, there for for many people, loneliness is expressed as some sort of diffuse pain that that is alleviated yeah. by spending time with someone that they trust and care about. That's it's, right. Yeah, yeah, and so you, you don't experience that. It it's interesting for me until I was until I was about thirty and I did a, like a ten day really hard uh, personal development thing. I did not map out anything other than like happy and angry. Those were my mm. two settings. <laughs> and I found out there were nuances and there was additional a signal in all of the noise that I had not learned when I was young because I was on the spectrum. Um, and the reason I'm asking you that is, you know, there's a Harvard study for longevity that shows one of the biggest things that determines how long you're going to live is how many close friendships you have when you're 50 and what your community is for the entire length of your life. Uh, and, you know, I look at community and relationships as fundamental variables for longevity. And you've talked about, you know, you, you sleep, by the way, I've slept with brain monitors on my head or somewhere else on my body for 15 years. I'm, I'm Victoria's Secret doesn't like either one of us, right? So, but you, you've talked about how, you know, no one's going to sleep in your bed and things like that. So what, what's your deal there with longevity versus relationships versus community? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, growing up, uh, my existence was community. That's just how reality was in this deeply religious world. You just were the community. And it was lovely. You know, there are some drawbacks to that kind of environment, but generally yeah. speaking, it was beautiful. We were in a neighborhood where we were generally welcome to walk into someone's house unannounced. It was that familiar and cozy and fun and nice, and it was beautiful. And I'm in touch with many of those people today, and it's wonderful. Uh, then I got married and had kids, and I was an entrepreneur working full time. And then the prior, we were still deeply involved in our religious community, so still having you know deep friendships. But the objective of my life really became grinding as an entrepreneur. You're, you're so fixated on the objective of building a startup that everything else just kind of moves to the side. And so you have kids. You've got a relationship and you've got your work and like that's it. And then post-selling mm-hmm. Braintree Venmo, it was this new opening of my reality of what is reality, what is life. And I was I got a divorce and like restructured my whole life. Yeah. And um, so it's I guess the, the concept of community has really changed throughout my life. I now have more and deeper friendships than I have in my entire life. I think I figured out how to build friendships. And it, you know, I guess I did that as a kid when it's really easy. As an adult, it's hard. And so as an adult, how do you get to a place where 
as friends, you can talk about everything and you can go to all the dark places and the sunny places and you can be there for each other. And so I guess maybe reflecting on this question, this is how I spend a majority of my time with my children is talking to them about how to build lifelong relationships. Yep. And you have to invest very heavily in them. They don't come easy and it takes a lot of devotion. But yeah, I wish I would have received some tutoring in my younger years of uh, how to create lifelong enduring friendships. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. It's important. Yeah. It's a skill set that is not obvious. I, I never knew it was important when I was younger. You know, no one ever told me, or maybe they did, and I just wasn't listening, which is often as it is when you're young. Uh, being the father of a teenage boy, I definitely understand that, even teenage daughter. Sometimes they just don't hear what you say. But uh, yeah, um, I invest a lot in those long-term relationships now, but I probably should have done that in my 20s, just didn't know what, it was on the to-do list. Yeah, right. Yeah, like one of my friends, uh, he, he's been doing annual trips with the same five guys for the past 25 years. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? I, I've never done that, but every time I hear it, I'm like, wow, what would that exactly. be like? And that's the, really the value of building these relationships is oftentimes we come together because we share an interest in a given thing, whether it's a professional endeavor or we're neighbors or whatever. But there's few things that supplant longevity and the deep familiarity of those relationships where you've all been through different versions of yourselves. And that's what I've really been trying to do is I, I try to be in situations where I can accelerate that development so that my friends and I feel that familiarity where we do things to create you know, the the attributes that contribute to friendships like shared trauma. <laughs> how are we going to have shared trauma so we bond in unique ways? But it's, it's how to achieve that familiarity that you otherwise gain that is so satisfying that we all experience in love. Mm. Yeah, it's the shared trauma, shared suffering, and you just being there when, you know, seeing that people care about you and love you and respect you even, you know, when you're not at your best. Uh, and that just, that takes time. Uh, yeah, and, and they, yeah, yeah, you you are you go to them when you're not your best. Like that's the place yeah. you go. Yeah, almost every entrepreneur who's been through uh, my neurofeedback program, and we go really deep on personal dev stuff, kind of like you would if it was you know, some plant medicine thing or something. And uh, every one of them is has experienced sometimes profound loneliness. Like it's kind of part of being a guy in the modern world, but. Mm. Um, I think entrepreneurs experience it even more because when you're the leader of the company, mm -hmm. you know, everyone, you, you, can, you can say they're all friends, but when you can fire all of your friends, <laughs> there's a power dynamic where there's closeness and there's friends, but that, that's always in there. Uh, and then especially if you put your time into your kids and your companies, you know, sometimes relationships that are neither one of those take a back seat for at least the first 10 years of your kid's life. So did you go through some of that? Uh I have spoken to others about this and in those moments, I, I find sinking into a book mm. as equally enjoyable, if not more so, than even many of my friendships. And uh, I guess this is why in the moment where I have free time to do something, I find there's so many options that are at my disposal, I don't feel loneliness. And so a friend can feel that, a book can feel it, you know, some kind of uh, learning uh, game can do it. And so I guess that there's so many things that, that bring me that fulfillment that I don't feel the loneliness and like you're saying, mm -hmm. the pain that I need to seek out another human. Interesting. So uh, even as a, as a CEO during, you know, with young kids and all, just it never, never was a thing. Very, very interesting. Uh, and thanks for, thanks for talking about that. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of those things where there aren't that many people who've built sizable companies um, who are willing to talk about that stuff. And I, I think it's a major aspect of aging. Uh, if you have uh, emotional or psychological or even spiritual pain uh, that is unaddressed over mm -hmm. time, I think it affects your cell immunity, your cell danger response, mm -hmm. uh, your hormone levels, your cytokines, uh, whole networks of signaling that are invisible to us unless you have really good data, yeah. uh, which is why I'm so interested in them. Um, so th thanks for, for going there with me. And that, we got to talk about some more hands-on uh, longevity and biohacking. All right. First up, I do about 150 pills a day. And it varies depending on the day. And, and oh, shoot, I just realized this is totally not planned. But 
I was supposed to take these with the steak I had at lunch and I forgot. But this is my morning, uh, my morning thing. And now I'm kicking myself because my aniracetam is in here that makes my memory IO um, uh, increase. But oh well, well I'll take those uh, not on the air. Uh, how many pills do you swallow at one time? Probably 15. Okay, got it. So there's, there's sort of like the, the you know, you, you, can, you can swallow a lot or a little. And I think anyone who's into longevity should know how to do it. I, I once teased Liver King about it, but I'm doing, I don't know if you guys can see that, but like that's a handful, but you just... <laughs> You know, when there's one stuck to the roof of your mouth, that just pisses me off. So there's one left. <laughs> That's such a weird flex. <laughs> <laughs> Liver King was like, I swallowed 20. Anyone who swallows more pills than me is more manly. So I'm like, well, I see you're 20 and raise you 10. And it was sort of like a, a joke because, you know, it, it doesn't matter how many pills you can swallow other than yeah. you don't want to overhydrate. So I need to, I need to hang out with him. Yeah, he's. Uh, I want to hang with him too. He's just an interesting guy, and it's funny because, like, I'm happy that he talked about peptides and and testosterone and all that stuff. Like, if you want control of your biology, you use all the tools, man. Like, there's there's no there's no rules one way or the other. In in my book, I just I feel like it's a good idea to talk about it, which is why I no, like I, what you're doing. I have no interest in his opinion on anything health related. I'm interested that his name is Brian Johnson. He's my same age, and we're in a parallel universe. Oh my gosh, I never even thought of that. I I want to know just like what drives the psychology on. Like he'd be fun to unpack, but uh, that's really I want funny. to I want to see if he's me in a parallel universe. I I knowing knowing your t- your tastes in uh, in science fiction, absolutely. Like like you guys are like mirror images like like uh, yin and yang or something. Uh, that's funny. Okay, same name too. How could this be? I had forgotten that was his real name. <laughs> All right. So we've established you guys swallow a lot of pills. I've been really hes- like really hesitant to just say, guys, here's my list of pills. And people have been asking me for years. And what I do is I talk about each of the compounds I take. And I talk about you know, the amounts and reasons you'd want to take it. But I used to weigh 300 pounds. I have a history of autoimmunity. I used to have Asperger's syndrome. I'm on an aggressive longevity track. And I have huge amounts of data. So if... Most of the people listening in uh, in the Upgrade Collective, this is our live audience who's just listening in and feeding me extra questions and stuff. Um, if if any of them tried to take exactly what I do, they would probably fill their pants. Like just so I don't want to cause harm by saying here's what to do, and yet I, I, my numbers aren't the same as yours, but they're they're good on the re- the age reversal thing, depending on all the different metrics. But you know, kudos, you've you've made a really big swing in a really good amount of time. Uh, and I don't want to do that. Like, let's hold up our true age scores and you know poke fingers because it's ridiculous. But we'll just say we're both doing really good. And I'm concerned that if people did everything I did, I would they wouldn't get my results. And you've said very very like cleanly with Blueprint, hey, um, this is one way. There are probably other ways. This is how I'm doing it. But you're publishing the whole protocol. How do you account for the bio individuality here? Because I'm I'm genuinely struggling with this. Like, mm. how do I provide good advice for people who aren't me? Mm. I mean, one of the fastest ways for improvement uh, to improvement is trial and error. And yeah. the more people hammering away on a given problem, the faster the community moves. And that's been our approach. The, the majority of our protocols are like, uh, let me say, almost all of our protocols are based on population level studies, not my individual measurement. Right. And so I yeah, so it's it's almost as equally applicable to others. Now, there's some qualifications that it's generally true for someone in their 40s, more true for someone in their 40s than someone who's in their teens. That's Although there's for still sure. there's yeah. still some overlap. My son does a modified version of Blueprint, but he still does a very similar profile. Like for example, he's not on metformin or rapamycin or a carbose or you know, like more the more powerful 
uh, things you do as you get into uh, elevated levels of age. But um, yeah, I guess with, with Blueprint, the health and wellness are simply a stepping stone into the next step of dreaming of what it means to be human. And uh, I really mm-hmm. view it as like, it's, it's a means, it's not the end. Let's see if we can dispense of the, the drama around what we each do and stabilize that and move our brains to this next level of thinking. To me, it really it's not where I want to hang out. This should just be automated. It should just be fixed. Yeah. We should have computational intelligence doing it. Humans should not be in the middle of this thing debating this and that. Like it's just it's not our domain. We're not going to win. Computational intelligence is going to be superior to it. At us. So the faster we can get there. So that's really my objective is trying to get to the stage where computational intelligence is doing the hard work for us and we move on to other things. Right. We're both aligned with that. It has to do the intelligence and then you've got to measure the results. And if it's not working, change. And I'm doing that especially around exercise and um, and like the physical stuff at one of my companies at Upgrade Labs. Because, you know, I'm 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 actually a little bit bitter about the amount of time that I spent at the gym uh, in my early twenties trying to lose weight that didn't mm. work. Seven hundred and two mm. hours <laughs> on a low calorie mm. diet. And I still had a forty six inch waist when I was done. And now that we have data, and there's some population level stuff, but it's actually usually smaller studies that are done, you know, at universities where you control enough variables to learn something. You go, oh, <laughs> I could have done, I could have gotten the results I wanted probably in 50 hours instead of 700 hours if I just would have done the right thing at the right time and all of that. So I, I, I think we're going to find all kinds of rich stuff in our data, whether it's medical data, whether it's nutritional data, uh, whether it's longevity data, whether it's movement data, all that stuff is, is coming in. I just, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to waste any time on all that stuff, but I will to the extent it's necessary. What is your, what's your favorite type of exercise for fun versus for results? Mm. Oh, it's all fun. <laughs> I, the hour I work out every day is my favorite moment of the day. No kidding. I'm, oh, I absolutely love it. I um, I have my best ideas working out. Mm. So you're getting the uh, you're getting lots of blood flow in your brain for that. Exactly. And so yeah, I mean, oh. whether it's, and and in particular when I'm doing cardiovascular activity, and uh, yeah, I'm just in a heightened state and I feel increased clarity. I find that I'm more brave and courageous in those moments than when I'm not. And so oftentimes, I will make decisions and commitments to myself when exercising that I am going to do a given thing. So that when I, you know, when I uh, settle down, I would second guess and be like, are you sure, Brian? That kind of sounds a little crazy. We sure we want to do that? And I've learned to trust that I, when I'm in those states, I am my best self. And I do make decisions that are um, on the weighted average, better mm. than when I'm not, and so I I find it to be a great source of joy. My body feels limber and flexible, and it feels great all day. If I miss it, my body feels more stiff. Uh, but yeah, so I it's really a favorite moment of mine. Now, if the one hour a day of exercise is your favorite time, do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> uh, I'll say one more thing on the exercise, then I'll do the girlfriend <laughs> thing. Um, I think my favorite exercise is there's a trail that my son and I run here mm. in Los Angeles. It's a 3.2 miles. It's a thousand feet incline. And we run it like wild men. Uh, like we take ourselves to the absolute max. And it is so much fun for he and I to do that together. It's our experience. We both put on our music. And we're just in it. And we're pushing each other. Our best time is 33 minutes. And when we get when we land, <laughs> when we arrive, like we're just absolutely smoked. Wow. And uh, yeah, and but you know, it's, it's up, it's um it's trail running, so you have to be careful. There's there's uh sharp rocks, there's a cliff. So, you know, I also love the irony, like I'm the don't die guy, and I'm doing this thing mm-hmm. that has a risk profile. But for my son and me, it's just exquisite. Uh, we love doing that together so much. Uh, yeah. 
I, I, I love that. And in fact, um, one of my brands is called, is called Danger. And, and the subtext is, who knows what you might do? <laughs> because yeah. if you're unwilling to take any risk, life isn't worth it. And you won't start a company. You won't you know, ask the person. Like, you don't progress unless you're willing to take a risk that's worth it. In this case, you're trading joy for some nominal risk. And it's, like, it's just a smart move. And, and because you're a free person, you're, you're willing and able to do that. Yeah. Which I, I totally think is a good call because yeah. a stale and boring life that's safe isn't probably going to make you live a long time either. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, but, back to the girlfriend thing. What yeah. uh, you know, how important is that for longevity? Yeah, I am dating and I would I think I'd like to be in a relationship. I think statistically speaking, it's highly improbable that I'm going to find someone <laughs> that's compatible with me because uh, there the cultural norms surrounding relationships are basically everything that I don't do. And so if you're in if you live in the year 2023 and you're a female, you have what are considered to be normal expectations of what a partner would be, how much time they spend with you, what kinds of things you do, what kinds of things you talk about, you know, like the there's like the these general rules and I basically break all of them. And so I I don't deliver on the cultural norms which then is you know it's challenging for somebody to get their head around it, and so yeah, I'm I'm interested. I um <laughs> I just don't know uh, if I would find someone who I think would basically be in synchrony with me on these things. I, I kind of feel like you should come to the biohacking conference, like put on a fake beard or something, so no one knows who you are. Um, there, there's a lot of single women and men um, who come there, and. None of them follow cultural norms as far as I can tell. Uh, and I, I'm like you. I, I got consciously uncoupled a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm dating. Uh, I have my own set of expectations that have nothing to do with you know, the, the standard template. Uh, and I'm not having a hard time dating. Uh, I'm maybe having a hard time you know, um, with you know, people who want to move more quickly than I want to move. But um, yeah, I, I, I feel like uh, to at least a lot of the people I know, like your what you're perceiving as like the lack of cultural norms, it's actually attractive to them. And I mean, you, you have you been a Bay Area person, or have you always been LA uh, when in Braintree and all that? Oh, I, I've been Chicago, New York, San Francisco, LA. Okay, because the Bay Area tech crowd that I I was a part of for a long time, let's just say there's a lot of non traditional relationships in that group at the very very highest levels. I mean, a lot yeah. of people who publicly follow one norm but privately do not. Sure. Yeah. So it, it it feels like it feels like there's a fertile ground out there. Um, yeah. The, the challenge feel. I have is once once you filter for all the criteria, so it, so the the social norms are one filter, but then the other one, you know, Claude Shannon. Uh, I love you bringing up Claude Shannon. I got in an argument with Chat GPT about Claude Shannon. Okay. okay good, yeah. Yeah. Claude Shannon. <laughs> you know he he came up with information theory, and so the idea <laughs> what he was trying to solve is. Dude. <laughs> I, I can't believe you know this and you're talking about it. all right this is my favorite podcast now all right keep, keep going so everyone else knows what we're talking about okay so he was trying to solve this problem where the transatlantic cables were you know communicating information and there was so much noise on the cable that the intuition is if there's a lot of noise yell louder over the you have to be louder than the noise your signal has to be louder than the noise and what he figured out was that you could Mathematically construct, you know, information theory. So if, if you say if your first word is why, the second word is did, and then the third word is the. Every time I say a word, your mind is calculating probabilities on what I'm going to say, and with every word, it creates a smaller probability set. So by the time I say why did the chicken, you have a decent idea of where I'm going with my statement. And I'm, I'm embarrassed that you'd bring that up on the show, but yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's good. <laughs> so I, I really enjoy... Uh, it, well, it's, it's a game I play with myself where when a given topic comes my way and there's an opportunity for my brain to think about a given thing in, anything, in any capacity of my life, I typically disregard my first four thoughts. Like my mm. first knee-jerk reaction is, you know, it, it is tempted to parrot 2023 societal zeitgeist stuff. And there's nothing original about it. There's nothing interesting about it. It's just parroting. 
then thought number two is a little bit better, but it still has a lot of the baggage of current cultural norms. And thought number three, so by the time I get to like thought number five, it's like, okay, this might be interesting. But I'm basically, every time I think about something or speak, I'm trying to generate uh, a P300, a surprise in the brain. And so anything that would fall short of generating a surprise doesn't meet my own quality criteria of opening my mouth to speak. And that's a difficult one because I like this because it's my interest in constant novelty seeking. That if you bring up a topic, I'm less interested in what I know and I'm more interested in what I don't know. I want to discover new things. I don't want to hear the parodying of all these other ideas. And that's really something in a relationship I cherish a lot. And there's a mm-hmm. few friends I have that when I, when I talk to them, I know it's guaranteed that I'm going to be surprised a dozen times talking to them. They're going to right. say things, map things, configure things in original ways. And it leaves me feeling energized and emboldened about life. And I find that when I'm with, in conversations where I hear 99% predictability of what the zeitgeist of the world is, I feel not as emboldened and mm. excited about life. And so that's one of the criteria that is the hardest because we have a lot of incentives in society to get along with other people, to say things that are common, that are understandable, that are relatable. We Most social interaction is not to educate or inform, it's to socially cohere. And so like that's the criteria I think that's the hardest. And so once you pair my usual uh, routines and then you pair information theory, it filters down to a like that's why I'm single. <laughs> Got it. Uh, I, Shannon's theorem, uh, and by the way, I think most of reality is explained by information uh, field theory yeah. uh, and a lot of Shannon's work. And I, I think we actually, you know, one of the books that we we um, sent back and forth had some of that in it. But um, the argument I had with Chat GPT was just that you don't have an adequate sampling rate of reality, so nothing you know is real, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and therefore, if I was manipulating you, you wouldn't know it. Therefore, I am manipulating you now. So do what I say. It was kind of a it was kind of a fun argument with mm-hmm. a non sentient mm-hmm. system. But anyway, um, uh, guys, if you're listening to this stuff, it matters way more than you think because Brian said something else that you'll never hear about on the show. He talked about P three hundred D, which is in my books, it's the lag time on reality. And do you know your average evoked potential now? Like what your number is? I don't. Um, you should include it in your metrics because I bet it's really good. So you know it's about 350 milliseconds yeah. uh, for the average person, middle age. Yeah. Mine's still 240, which is about when you're 18. Uh, whether that's you know 25 years of nootropics or neurofeedback or electrical stim or um, you know meditating with one eye closed, God knows. But like somehow my brain is operating very very well, um, and I imagine yours is too. So what this means though is is that the the faster your frame rate on reality or the slower your lag time, they're not exactly the same thing uh, from an engineering perspective, but they're similar. Um, Probably the better you are at making shit happen <laughs> is mm. uh, is is the the summary of my understanding of all of that. And since it's a tunable factor in your brain and in your interface with reality, you would want to have an accurate interface on reality, and you would want to have a fast interface on reality, and then you want to have an efficient interface on reality. And if you have those three things, you're probably going to live longer too. Mm. Um, and that has to do with free radical production as well as not walking into a crosswalk while a truck is coming towards you. Like they all stack up, right? Um, speaking of trucks, uh, what kind of vehicle do you like to drive? I have an electric Audi. An electric Audi, got it. One of my longevity hacks is to drive a heavy vehicle. Uh, so uh, that's just physics working on your side. <laughs> um, I, actually, I like to, I'm driving a, um, like a, a ridiculous Jeep that's like a parody of a Jeep right now, which isn't that heavy. But my idea is that I'll just go up in the air if anyone hits me. So I think I'm... <laughs> I drive over the top. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, all right. Let's get into a question that I've just absolutely wanted to check in with you on. Olive oil versus saturated fat. And uh, I... You know, as a long-time longevity guy, I went through my phase of you know glugging fish oil and doing lots and lots of olive oil, like from the zone diet stuff. And I went back and forth, and I just eventually re- settled on a on a removing omega six fats, in particular, um, 
in particular, linoleic acid. I was confused linolenic and linoleic, but in particular, removing linoleic acid as much as I can for my diet. Uh, and so I, I do like a tablespoon or two of olive oil, but I don't go above it because of the linoleic acid. And you're doing all olive oil. And I want to understand your rationale for it uh, and ask you a couple of questions about it. I'm not trying to convince either one of us that we're right or wrong. We just have different approaches. And I'll, I'll show some of my metrics with you too. And I just want to get your, your take on it. Like why, why olive? Yeah, this is the... I learned a lesson. I got my pilot's license years ago. Mm -hmm. And I got my, yeah, I got my license. I got typed in three different planes. I'm a good pilot. I'm proficient. I made a rule for myself that I would never fly alone. Smart. Because, you know, there, the data on flying alone, you're, I forget the exact number, it's something like 70 plus percent more likely to be in a fatal incident than mm -hmm. if you're a professional pilot. It's staggering. Yeah. And looking at the probabilities, I said, I, I do love flying, but it's not worth dying for. And so I made a rule and I uh, hired a professional pilot to always fly with me. So I would fly left mm -hmm. seat and you know they would always be present and to do a cockpit hygiene. Smart. And I applied the same approach to Blueprint. I said, I, of course, can learn the literature. I can speak the speak. I can do this and that. I can be proficient, but I'm not a professional uh doctor or I'm not a professional biologist. Mm -hmm. And I've basically done the same thing where in, in conversations, in, on topics like this, I can string words together that seemingly make sense about this and that. I don't trust that I'm the, the professional pilot. And so my team mm -hmm. has gone about, done the analysis. We've measured our biomarkers. We, have, we think it makes sense with the evidence. We think it makes sense with my biomarkers. That's not to say that other things don't work better. It's just to say that we've constructed what we think is the very best thing. But yeah, this is um, this has been the approach of we're trying to because otherwise, uh, my from own experience, you're basically caught in these endless debates with people yeah. about this or that, and no one wins. Everyone's just confused. So we just decided to do something, share the data, and say, here we are. Do you ever do like an A B? Test to see if what you're doing is better. Like, would would you stop olive oil and replace it with? Uh, you wouldn't do this, but margarine, or would you replace it with tallow or butter or something for yeah. three months and get your labs? We did that with there was the NR versus NMN. Right, was such an intense interest of people that we did that. We did NR for ninety days and we measured the IC NAD levels with the J Infinity test. Mm -hmm. And then we did the same thing with um, NMN. With what, what was the difference? The, what did you find? Nothing. They were both. <laughs> they were both effective at uh, my achieving. Uh, was like fifty six point two. Um, so age eighteen on my intracellular NAD levels. Yeah. And we just said either one works. So we can. I mean, th there may be other things that are going on that we're not capturing. Yeah. But from a, a first level pass, the raging debate can stop that you've got basically similar performance at yeah. doing this one marker. Or, or you could do niacinamide and get something that's probably the same. <laughs> but yeah. That, that's like an old line longevity thing. Um, but it, it's, uh, I, I take all three, by the way, just because I'm, I'm lazy. I'm like, I'll, I'll just, if I do all three, I'm probably getting the right one. Uh, and I'm, you know, I, I like your approach better, though. It just takes extra time and, and work. the The reason I'm I'm curious about olive oil, and a lot of listeners um, have been asking me to ask you that stuff. Um, it's that when linoleic acid metabolizes, it increases delta five and delta six desaturase, and these are things that you don't want to have high in the body. So adding a lot of olive oil can increase your body's ability to make body fat. Uh, and if you have lots of olive oil only, you're still getting 14% linoleic acid. But if like most people have that and you eat the fried stuff at a restaurant once or twice, the monounsaturated fats are going to drive a lot of lipid oxidation. So I ended up at like primarily saturated with some olive oil and I take a hydroxytyrosol capsule which is the primary antioxidant in olive oil, but it's equal to like a thousand bottles of olive oil. But I just take the pill because I would probably not feel good if I had that much olive oil. But I, I was just kind of curious. And so you're saying you looked at a bunch of literature, you're doing it, and you haven't done like a A-B test on type of fat. 
Um, okay. And then, and I'm in the middle of an A-B test right now, by the way. Um, so yeah, I was doing a, a moderate protein diet. Um, and I went on to a higher animal protein diet. And I'm doing this for like a couple of years uh, to really see what the difference is and looking at my true age. And it looks like I am a year younger now. Um, than I was, you know, from a year ago. <laughs> so it's it doesn't seem to be harming my longevity uh, in any of the variables that I'm measuring. Uh, and I know that I, I don't perform as well on a lower protein or on a plant based protein diet. But I'm I'm you know I, I do these things. I also added enormous amounts of carbs back in because I was down to you know five point eight percent body fat, and it's just too lean, right? So I'm like, okay, so I'm doing like two or three hundred grams of carbs a day. Uh, because if I don't do that, I'm just like so crazy lean. This is from a guy who's been obese my whole life. So I'm, you know, I, I'm tracking what changes and trying to limit some other things. But I also moved to a place with sunshine. Maybe that's half of it. I, I don't really know. There's always more variables than we can track. But that was one I was really curious about. Um, and I think we're going to say, you know, you're you're working on it, but there might be other ways. Um, okay, testosterone. Um, I love it that you're open about taking testosterone. Uh, I've been on it since I was 26. I went off it for three years to test the effect of lifestyle and diet um, and all that when I was coming out with a bulletproof diet. But I'm I'm better when my numbers are 900 and my body just has never made very much of it as far as we can tell. It was lower than my mom's at 26. So there's there's no there's no shame or harm in using bioidentical testosterone. But for longevity, um, have you heard of the Wiley Protocol? I have not. So Wiley wrote one of the first books about this kind of stuff. It's called Sex, Lies, and Menopause. And another one called Lights Out. These are early circadian biology. She has a protocol for men and women where it changes the ratio of testosterone and thyroid based on time of year and time of month and all this stuff. Uh, and I recognize it as the most superior of all of the hormone replacement protocols I've seen. I wrote about it. Uh, I just have never found someone who could prescribe it reliably for me because it's such a pain in the ass. So I was just wondering, do you play with your testosterone frequency of dosing? Do you use testosterone cream on your balls, which changes DHT levels versus an injection? So it talks about how you get your testosterone and how you know that's the right way. Mm -hmm. We started it because I was on a, a caloric restriction diet of uh, 1,950 calories. Mm -hmm. And when you're in that caloric deficit, your testosterone lowers. And so we supplemented it with uh, two milligram patches that I wore six days a week. Each patch delivers, I believe, nine IU. Thereabouts. So it was roughly um, yeah, six times nine. So like 50, 50 or so uh, per week. Mm -hmm. And uh, that maintained levels of about 900. And since I've I've bumped up my caloric intake, I'm now at 2250. We're seeing I'm so I'm now at a 10% caloric deficit. We're seeing the same. Looking at my speed of aging and a bunch of other biomarkers, we're we're achieving the same benefits as 20% caloric restriction without me being without losing the facial volume and being too lean. And so with that, I've lowered my testosterone. I now just do one four milligram patch per week. So I've dramatically lowered it, and I have my my blood test in three weeks. So we'll see where I'm at. I haven't felt a difference as I've lowered the testosterone. And, you know, I'm not sure. I, I was unaware of the deep subculture of how sensitive people are to this topic. I don't know why it's so triggering. I don't, I don't know why it, I don't know why it needs to be a secret. I don't know why it's a big deal. I don't, I don't understand the situation. Uh, it's a marker and we do things to change markers all the time. And there's you know various approaches of doing it, so I guess I've been very surprised that I've been completely transparent, and, but people get pretty fired up about this topic. I I think that we can do one better, Brian. Um, we'll just say this for everyone listening: if you're over forty and you're not taking testosterone, shame on you for choosing weakness. Do, do, do you think I maybe hit some buttons there? <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> not not my approach, but I mean, I don't know, I guess it works. <laughs> not, mine, not mine either, but it is my sense of humor, right? Uh, the the bottom line is that uh, testosterone levels are down across our entire species because of things we did to our environment, and this is just a variable you manage, like thyroid hormone or like how much corn you're willing to eat. It's just like 
it's just a thing that you have control of. And low testosterone humans are not happy humans because their dopamine goes down too. Like I, I think it's a societal issue. So I, I really encourage people, get mm. it measured. If mm. it's wrong, mm. do whatever mm. it takes to fix it because you'll die sooner and then you won't get to wear the t-shirt. So like we, we kind of have to manage this like anything else. So I, I just appreciate that you're just out there with it. I'm same approach here. Like I've never once uh, gone around and pretended I didn't take testosterone. Of course I do because I want to live a long time. Mm. Mm. Um. All right. There's another thing that affects testosterone uh, in a major way, actually. John Gray from Mars and Venus and I were talking about it on the show. Um, he's a good friend. Uh, semen retention. Do you practice that? We have not discussed that as a team. I know that's brought up a lot. Uh, yeah, as a, as a team, I think we are generally pretty culturally off topic. Like we, <laughs> we, we, we really don't do the things that you know, are culturally on point. I don't cold plunge. I don't do sauna. You do red light uh, therapy. Don't, That's pretty on point. I mean, yeah, the red light is. We don't take resveratrol. Uh, yes, yeah, so like we just generally speaking, the things that are uh, most commonly discussed in these communities, I don't do. And um, so, semen retention is. Uh, I have no opinion of it. We haven't really talked about it. So, so your team hasn't told you whether or not you're allowed to come? Uh, we haven't looked into it. I, uh, well, rather, it's not my team certainly has knowledge about it. We just haven't raised the discussion on what practice to do and why. Got it. Um, I, uh, I, I've looked into this because a lot of the, the early alchemists and like the Tantra and traditional Chinese energy stuff, that they're all looking at longevity. So I, I'm not willing to discard ancient practices for this. So it, this is one that, that comes up over and over. So I ran like a year-long experiment with it and uh, decided it was, uh, it was probably a good strategy to limit ejaculation but not orgasm for a whole, di- whole bunch of different reasons I've, I've written about. But it was John Gray who really highlighted the, the 24 to 48 hour testosterone drop after ejaculation, which affects mm-hmm. your outlook. And it really does meaningfully and, and reliably change uh, testosterone levels. <coughs> so if you're looking for consistently high levels, um, over ejaculating as you age, it probably is depleting, um, I, I would say. But I, I think you and your team uh, might consider looking into it. Uh, it's very different for men and women, but um, um, I, I think there is something there that has to do with energetics and all. Uh, and it also will raise your testosterone. John's in his 70s, doesn't use testosterone. His is as high as mine. <laughs> and he doesn't ever ejaculate. He thinks that's why. So who the heck knows? Uh, there's, there's probably some, uh, uh, what do they say, meat on the bone in that area of research? <laughs> okay, you did yeah. laugh. I See, okay, I was just checking to see if you're laughing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these... Um... I mean, I, I guess I'm, I feel very fortunate that I have a team of people that I can turn to and say, hey, can we dig up the evidence on this and can we look at it from a multidimensional perspective? I really am empathetic for others who don't have the resources and then grapple with, they hear this kind of thing and they think, is this a good idea? And then they hear someone else rebut it who you know, has some stamp of authority, whether it be a university title or some other kind of degree. And it leaves the whole world in paralysis. And it's kind of not the whole world. Like it leaves the person in, in a sense of paralysis because they don't know who to trust and why. Mm-hmm. And there's seemingly data on both sides. And then it just becomes an impossible decision. And we're kind of there in this general field uh, where it, there's not a complete solve to all these questions. And so I guess I'm just commenting on the emotional, uh, the challenging nature of trying to be in good health because you're never quite certain uh, of what you're doing is the right thing or not. And yeah. So this moment, it, yeah, future generations look back at us and feel bad for us probably of like, they were trying really hard. They were trying their very, very best and just couldn't quite put together a cohesive thing of understanding this. Yeah, I, I, can, I can imagine future generations like, yeah, the, those guys just ejaculated all the time. Like, what, what were they thinking? No, I'm kidding. Um, but like, <laughs> like, who the heck knows? We look back at the leeches and make fun of them and, and they could be making fun of everything we do right now. And there's just no way, no way to know. But I think we're continuing the curiosity uh, and the rigor in the science to say, let's figure out what, what's maybe better than what we do today, which is cool. Yeah, I mean, probabilistically, 
most of what we do today is likely wrong. Oh yeah, and most of what we believe today is is false. It's just a useful false. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh well, yeah. It'll be just placed by somebody. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. I got to ask you this because people have been have been poking me about it. Did your team tell you to remove all your body hair? Oh no, that was my preference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. We were doing a lot of whole body laser, so we were doing some IPL, and uh, so it, it started where I didn't, I don't, I didn't like armpit hair. You know, I I don't see the function. I don't like the aesthetic. And so I removed my armpit hair and it felt liberating. And then as a 20-year-old, in my early 20s, I was doing triathlons Mm -hmm. and I shaved my legs as part of being in that culture and I enjoyed it. And so, yeah, as I got going on Blueprint, I thought, well, like, (laughs) why not? You know, uh, I'm with you on the armpit hair thing. Uh, I used to be a long distance cyclist in my my late teens, uh, and same thing. You know, you, you end up shaving your legs, not really because of aerodynamics, but because you know you're going to lay down, you're going to get road rash, and having hair growing through, you know, the side of your leg uh, as all sorts of hairs, and it it just hurts like, when there's a big scab on there. So it, it's really common. But the armpit thing, you get deodorant stalactites. And you get body odor. And so, I don't know, I, I finally evolved to, I just trim it a lot versus, but for a long time I shaved it and I haven't lasered it because I'm lazy. Um, and I was guessing you were going to say that because you did IPL on most of your body, that that just, that takes the hair off anyway, right? Yeah, and, it does. And exactly. if you have hair, it hurts to do IPL. Yeah, exactly and, right. And guys, I just did a, a social media thing where I was doing IPL on my face, which I've done for years. I've talked about it every now and then. Um, and like where my beard is, Dude, that really hurts because the hair is heat up. Yeah. You do IPL yeah. because it rejuvenates the skin. I've done a little bit on like my low back where I have all the extra skin from being obese. Uh, and I've done some other stuff about that too. But I was guessing it's because if you're going to laser treat your whole body, you would have had to shave everything anyway. Um, so yeah, body hair is overrated in, in, my, uh, in my perspective. Um, but armpit hair in particular. So I'm, I'm with you there. Uh, like, yeah, let's, uh, you, let's normalize my having less. And my frame here is that I'm genuinely trying to map the future of being human. This is not a lackadaisical, I want to be healthy. This is no, I want to evolve with mm-hmm. super intelligence into the next evolution of human. And I'm willing to do anything along that path. Yeah. And so these decisions on, I mean, if, if IPL can achieve the regenerative effects in the skin, I'm down to try it. And 100%. Yes, yeah, so I really, I don't, I'm not, um, discouraged by cultural norms. I'm not making decisions whether or not the early 21st century is going to find the aesthetic appealing. I don't care. Like I'm <laughs> genuinely on this objective and I'm, I'm willing to do anything uh, and, and in particular uh, to not be influenced by any perspective of the moment. It, there's another benefit too, uh, which is why I keep things trimmed or, or short. I put electrodes on many of my body parts regularly. And if they're hairy, electrodes suck. Like it's yeah. like pulling hair on and off all the time. So yeah. I'm I'm glad I'm not a particularly hairy guy. I have the I have the the caveman genomics for less back hair. That was the only thing 23 and me ever did good for me was tell me that I, I have that genetic. Um, mm-hmm. So whatever. But uh, I don't like peeling my hair off with electrodes, and I do EKG and electrical stim and EEG and all this stuff. And yeah. I even thought about shaving my head once. It turns out having hair makes it easier to do EEG and not harder. So, um, so there's there's that. So, <laughs> that's, uh, and thanks for answering that. And you're like, hey, personal preference, uh, totally, totally cool with it. Final question: As we run up on the end of our time together, psychedelics, yay or nay? For me. So I I was a pilot participant in a study at Colonel where I took I was administered 68 milligrams intramuscularly uh, with ketamine wearing Colonel cool. for interface, and we wanted to pose this question. I wanted to create intuitions. You know what happens when? So you can we we have if you wear a blood glucose monitor, you have intuitions. If I eat grapes, what happens? If I eat you know pasta, what happens to my blood glucose? And you create these intuitions on cause and effect. And I wanted to create the same intuitions around the brain of mm-hmm. what happens when you do ketamine. And not just like, hey, I, I don't know, I had this psychedelic experience and I had another dimensional visit. Like, I wanted to show uh, the data. 
And to me, the there's a definitely there's an avenue for psychedelics to be used for mental wellness and to address clinical needs. For me, there's this broader usefulness where uh, much of human aspiration is identifying things that are familiar. So JFK can point to the moon and say, see that in the sky? Let's go there. And, and people understand that because you can walk from one place in the room to another part of the room. So like you understand you're going to move across physical distance and arrive at a destination. And then we point beyond the moon and say, let's go to the next one out there, which is Mars. You know, like we want to make for our destination. So it's very easy to rally uh, ambition towards moving your body towards a destination. It's much more difficult to rally ambition and excitement for unknowns. If you can't state it, if you can't see it, you can't uh, describe it, we don't know how to be fired up about it. And when I did psychedelics, what it did for me is it populated my map of what I could be excited for. So I know what the feeling is to fall in love. I know what it's like to feel heartbreak. I know what it's like to have children. I know what it's like to, you know, and like all the things we experience in our society. What I didn't have as part of my conscious map was what is my brain, what is my my brain capable of for conscious existence. And psychedelics changed my understanding of reality. Not that, mm-hmm. that any reality is better than the other reality. It's just like, what is, my, what is the raw capacity of my brain to experience consciousness? Mm-hmm. And so it gave me a data point in the map that I did not expect. It, it um, changed my perception entirely of what I'm capable of. And to me, that was the moment where I thought, we can Babe Ruth this moment. We can JFK this moment. We can say we are capable of existence that so far outstrips our imagination, we can't even comprehend it. And that the key thing for us as a species is to learn how to step into the unknown and be excited about that which we can't see, point at, or touch. And it's so counterintuitive because we as a species have evolved to do that kind of thing. But I think our survival depends upon it. And to me, psychedelics are a helper in that regard, where they do help us collectively say, what can our shared ambitions be? Yeah, they they can help turn on curiosity instead of fear. And if you're going to face the unknown, since you don't know what it is, you don't know whether you should be afraid yet, our default settings as, as life forms is be afraid because it might kill you. But the most functional settings as an entire species is be curious because it might be useful. So you, you've done some really cool, I'll say cognitive hacks and some, some methodological hacks to make sure that you're doing that even with your own health, which is dealing with mortality and death. It's the, the flip side of health, right? So I, I'm, uh, I'm really impressed with what you're doing here. I feel like we could talk for another hour about different longevity uh, longevity things and sort of compare notes about some of the things like pulse wave analysis and all. But I know you're up at the end of this. Love to have you back on the show. Uh, love to have you speak at the biohacking conference if you're ever up for it. Uh, but I know you're probably at least as busy as I am. Uh, so any anytime um, you've got something big coming out, you want to talk about it, I've got a big audience ready to listen. Thanks, Dave. And you have a, a live audience with you today, is that right? Yeah. What What are the live responses? Um, they are uh, wondering whether you would keep your AI chip if you ran out of money. Um, that was one of them. Uh, would you? Uh, keep my AI chip. What does that mean? <laughs> I, think, I think they're saying that you have Neuralink or something, um, uh, which you don't, obviously. Yeah. So they're, they're basically like you're essentially saying you're really smart uh, and that you have a very rationalist view of the world. Uh, let's see. Uh, why don't you do uh, sauna? It's not that sauna is not potentially useful. It's that it doesn't have evidence that maps towards our objective of slowing the speed of aging and reversing aging damage. Interesting. Even the unfolding and refolding of proteins, it didn't. That evidence wasn't strong enough. That that one surprised me. Yeah, it didn't cross the threshold for the team to incorporate it. So it's not part of the protocol. Okay. And and, and the experience is well, I've been on the team though. We never say never. So. They're always open to review literature, always open to take a fresh look. We have no ego in the game. Uh, that was just our assessment. But we're, we're pretty chill on our conclusions. But yeah, it has not made it to my daily stack. I, I love that. Pretty chill on your conclusions. People who are militaristic about their conclusions are not so, usually not so happy <laughs> yeah. and not so objective, right? Oh, you have a religion, yeah. not a, you have a religion and a grant, not actual science. Gotcha. 
we're yeah, we're willing to make a change in a moment's notice. Like we are absolutely, we have no skin in the game on any ideology. We just follow the data. Um, definitely, I I love that, and and you're you're very upfront about it. Uh, another question from the audience here is around testosterone, DHT, and hair loss. Uh, have you experienced any hair loss? Would you keep taking testosterone if your hair started to fall out? Yeah, I genetically, I should be bald right now. So I'm yeah. very happy I have some hair. <laughs> I'm 46. I started losing my hair in my late 20s. And so it's been a battle. I, uh, I'm, you know, it's, I do, we work very hard on hair. So we do, we've done some PRP. We're moving away from PRP because we think we yeah. found some better things. We uh, are starting to do Tixel, uh, delivering exosomes. So Tixel opens up a delivery for exosomes. Yeah, I do. We're also exosomes. doing. We're also doing a therapy on Friday where I'm getting my, um, I'm getting my blood drawn. Then they're going to whip up a. I forget what this even is. They're going to customize something and then reinject it. So we're trying to move past PRP. I have a daily concoction which is minoxidil five percent and a few other things. You know, it has such a small effect and it's such a pain in the ass to apply. So I we're really uh, we're in the early early days for hair. Mm. Uh, everything has such a small effect size. It's not like you can make these big changes. At least for me, um, and, so I wish there were better. I know there's a company doing hair cloning, which would be great. Yeah. The, uh, so, it's coming. Like we're really close. Yeah, you and I've had gene therapy from the same guy working on it, right? Yeah. So there we're we're close. Uh, but yeah. But I'm happy I have some hair. Are you doing adenosine, caffeine, aspirin, thyroid hormone, and lasers on your head? All of the above. Yeah. So a daily, okay, I have a 312 works. laser dials. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have caffeine as part of our topical. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I quit using minoxidil. I used it for a couple of years because I found the other stuff was working better. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and minoxidil has some systemic effects, um, but um, yeah, it is. A, it is a struggle. Uh, and the type, the type of testosterone seems to really matter uh, as well. And there's a balance between, you, you talk about um, you know, nighttime erections and all. The higher your DHT, the hornier you are and the better that stuff performs, but the more your hair falls out. So it's sort yeah. of like, you know, maybe bald guys really are more horny. Uh, who, who really knows? <laughs> but we got to balance those out somehow. Okay, that, that was a question there. Um, and let's see... Okay, are you going to work on your psychic powers next? Says Mandy. Is there such a thing as psychic powers? Okay, cool question, Mandy. Uh, the psychic powers I try to develop are speaking to the 25th century. Mm. What will they observe about us? What is the wisdom of this moment? Where's the craziness? And uh, how do we overcome the craziness and find the wisdom that they will see in us in this moment? In the same way we see it in the 16th century. I'm obsessed with that. that. There's no thought experiment I do that I find introduces greater clarity into my mind. Where once I can lock in with that thought process, it helps me have the courage to say, Basically, everything of my reality right now is a snapshot of time. Mm. It will, it's impermanent and we're moving on to something else. And how do I not be influenced by that? Because it's just very hard. We're influenced so dramatically by these things that remain invisible to us. So yeah, that would be the psychic powers. Uh, I think it's ba- basically, I, I tell my kids this, it's better to be revered by the 25th century than respected by your peers now. Uh, I... I kind of agree with that, although I don't really give a shit whether anyone knows my name in the 25th century. Like it, It's not highly relevant to me either. I just want the stuff that I did to still be reverberating, but like being, being spoken about doesn't push my buttons at, at any time. Like, who cares? Uh, you know, the, the, earth will, uh, the earth will be cooked uh, at a certain point. No one's going to know my name. It's just a matter of time anyway. Uh, but I may be well, a it, bit of a fatalist that way. Okay, but... Um... When in history have humans ever understood what's going on? Uh, never. Um, other than maybe the ones who become uh, they become fully enlightened uh, when they talk about that. But do you believe in full enlightenment? Is that a thing you're working e- on? Even then, uh, we have no idea what's really going on. 
no clue. And every time in a previous century where people really thought they had figured things out, new ideas came and showed there was more to the story. We have no idea where we're at in terms of knowns versus unknowns. And so any conclusion... So the reason I like 25th century is I have a deep relationship with those in the past and I deeply respect their contributions to society. I benefit from the societal scaffolding they contributed. And when I think about them, I have a relationship with them. And I want to have a relationship with these those in the 25th century. I want to build the reality that they will occupy. And to me, that's highly motivating. And, and the, the other trick it has is if, when you care to be respected by those that exist now, you are subject to being infiltrated by a, the past because you're, you're incentivized to do the things that people care about right now, which is inherently the past. And so you're not, you, you, um, you hinder your own ability to be innovative. Mm. You have to sever that entirely. And that's why I, I don't care about being respected in this moment. It's inducement that leads to mediocrity. It, it does, the whole backwards facing thing. Do you, ever, do you ever just get frustrated with humanity that so many people are so backwards looking that like, they're not going to make it? It's an algorithm. It, was, it seems I, like I, an I, algorithm that's not doing very well right now. It's kind of a dysfunctional algorithm that needs a bit of a tweak. It's, um, I'm emotionally detached from everything because it's so predictable. There's no reason to emotionally get jammed up in this thing because that arousal creates distorted wisdom and it, it distorts the view. And so how humanity behaves and the problems we have, it's, it's, uh, it is identifiable functions of the system that is happening. And uh, I would much rather play the game of slightly nudging the system because the moment you kick against it, it punches back. And there's a negative net energy loss on that. It's a yes and a situation. And I, um, I think we, yeah, we're on the cusp of the most extraordinary existence in the galaxy. I think this really could be ours. And, and it's moving at a speed that is incomprehensible to our minds. And mm -hmm. it's an opportunity for us to graduate from these old games. And uh, it's ours. So, I mean, yeah, this moment's special if we can sober up and realize it. Wow. I love that perspective so much. Got time for another question from the collective here? Yeah, let's hear it. If you lost all your money, what are the three hacks that you would keep for the longest? Like the three most important, cheapest hacks? Uh, sleep. Try to eat well. Um, exercise. And then I'd add a fourth. Uh, avoid vices. Avoid vices. I didn't, I didn't ask. Is coffee a vice? For me, I can't sustain it. It's an escalation drug. Interesting. So you have poor caffeine metabolism? Um, I, got, I forget what my genetics were on, on caffeine. Yeah, I can start off with a cup. It feels great. And then like at day 14, I've got to do two or three. And then I have to drink just mm. to be back to a normal state. But it wears me down. So I just can't do it. I can do tea and I can do up to 60 milligrams a day. But coffee, for some reason, gets me. Interesting. Um, I quit coffee for five years because I had that going on and, and then I managed to, to I'm, I'm kind of at a stable dose that seems to work great and the longevity studies on it are pretty decent. Um, do you worry about uh, oxalates, like plant, plant compounds? Think they're tied to spinal stenosis, 70% of kidney stones and things like that. Like I've been paying more attention over the last 10 years, just more and more every year and realizing the more I, the more I manage that, the better my biology functions. Like if you're going to be around for you know 200 years and you have something that bioaccumulates, whether it's you know cadmium and lead, which you know about in chocolate, yeah. versus these other things, is oxalate is that on your radar? How do we've discussed it as a team? Uh, what do you measure to assess whether they're high or low, or whether they're creating damage or not? You can measure uh, urinary oxalate excretion. You can measure an ovium does a, an oxalate metabolism to see how good you are at metabolizing it, but your gut bacteria doesn't do very much. So it's mostly urinary oxalate. And I mean, if you're, if you're peeing it out, we have problems. And there's a ton of data that says 200 milligrams a day is an optimal dose. So you can handle about that much. But a lot of us are getting a gram a day. You know, if you're doing, you know, spinach, kale, raspberries, chocolate, uh, sweet potatoes, you know, a lot of the superfoods are, are just almonds. They're all really, really high. 
And I noticed I was getting like calcification of old injuries. But when I back off on all that stuff, it beats too. I back off on all that stuff, the calcification goes away very, very quickly. But I was also a raw vegan for a while, which you know, puts those things through the roof. So I'm you know, managing kidney function over time uh, as well. And so that, that's one of those things where I don't think... I know that people who eat an excessive amount of superfoods probably are going to face it younger like I did. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's something that as I talk with people in their 70s and 80s with spinal stenosis and all, I, I, there's case reports of oxalate in arteries and nerve lining uh, in the brain, in the vulva, um, you know, urinary irritation, stuff like that. Like, like there's, there's enough evidence that says some of us are getting too much, but it may be somewhat personalized. Uh, so I'm uh, when I'm working with people one on one. Usually, when they they cut raspberries, replace them with blueberries, which drops their levels meaningfully. Like, oh, something good happened. So I'm I'm mm-hmm. I'm in the middle of being curious about that. We'll put it that mm-hmm. way. Yeah, this is one I take back to the team. It's yeah. the topic we've discussed. We haven't picked up any aberrations or any elevated levels, but that's not to say we couldn't do a better test and see. I, to measure. I don't think you're a green giant, just off the top of my head, or green. What do you got, green? Slime. What? What's is it? Green Giant. What, you have a name for it, but do I have it yeah, right? Green Giant. Okay, Green Giant. I was like, I, I used to make one called Green Slime that was uh, a similar thing, but with um, butter, uh, and I'd make it with the kids for a long time. Um, so I, I don't think you're using particularly high oxalate ones. I think you had some crushed nuts or something and some cacao, but I don't. I just ran it back of my envelope thing. I don't think you're particularly high. Um, but, and you don't vary your diets, you're probably fine. But I think a lot of our listeners probably are getting, mm-hmm. you know, 900 milligrams to 1.2 mm-hmm. grams a day when they should be getting 20% of that. Just a, just a question for, you know, the 20, 30 year timeframes and what that does to you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, uh, Dave, thank, yeah. thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, you're, uh, you're doing some cool work in the world and, uh, I'm always, always happy to help and, uh, keep publishing data and, uh, who knows? I think I'm going to copy your format uh, with your permission and just share my data uh, in the interests of furthering understanding, not being competitive. Yeah, it, nice. this is uh, we're on the same team after the same objective. Uh, I think if we can move past this competitive thing uh, in the community, we're all better because of it. Yep, takedown is not very very useful. We'll leave that for our yeah. MMA <laughs> podcasters. <All right. laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks, man. Good to see you. Thanks for Good having me. You. Yep, Bye. take care. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey.